All right, AP Chemistry, let's take a look at the next part of this unit, enthalpy and specific heat. Enthalpy is just the total heat energy of a system, and you can find it with that equation given. It's the internal energy plus the product of the pressure and the volume. And both enthalpy, pressure, volume, they're all state functions. The pressure volume work relationship is important. It has to do with gases either expanding or being compressed. When you have constant pressure, then work is equal to negative pressure times uh, the change in volume. Pressure is always positive or zero. So why that negative sign? Well, when a gas expands, that's because the system is doing work on the surroundings. And then W would be negative. But if the gas is being compressed, the surroundings are doing work on the system, the volume is decreasing, and W work is increasing. Here's that equation one more time. Now, we're not necessarily going to use this equation, but it's just that the change in enthalpy equals the heat gained or lost at a constant pressure. What you need to take away from this is when delta H is a positive value, that means endothermic. When delta H is a negative value, that means exothermic. You have to know that. You need to know that delta H negative is exothermic and that it's a product. Heat would be a product in the equation. We use delta H for enthalpy. And I just want you to know that there's lots of delta H's. You'll see delta H with various subscripts. F, R, X, N, just bunches of them. Not that important right now. There's several different ways we're gonna calculate delta H. You can do an experiment, you can do something called Hess's Law, and then just flat out math. But basically the change in H is the change in the products versus the reactants. The thermochemical equations show the reaction and delta H. Again, when delta H is positive, it's endothermic. When it's negative, it's exothermic. Enthalpy is an extensive property. That means it does depend upon how much you have. When you look at an appendix and you see delta H values, they are always given for one mole. So you could do some stoichiometry here. Let's say the delta H is 100 kilojoules for one mole. Well, what if you have two moles? You would simply double delta H. The enthalpy change for a reaction is equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign for the reverse reaction. In other words, if you're given a reaction and it says the delta H is positive 100, if you flip that equation around, delta H will now be negative. Pretty, pretty straightforward. And the enthalpy change for a reaction really does depend upon the states of the reaction, of the reactants in the products. You need to start paying attention to gases, solids, and liquids. When you look in the appendix of your textbook, for example, just look up water, you'll notice there are different values for water. Water is a solid and a liquid and a gas. And if you choose the wrong number, you're going to get the wrong answer. So start paying attention to phases of matter. One way to calculate delta H is through experimentation, and we will actually do this in this unit. We use something called calorimetry. We're just measuring the heat flow, and a calorimeter is the, is the device that we use. Now, this is AP chemistry, not a laboratory, so we use something as simple as styrofoam cups. We will take two styrofoam cups and put them together. Uh, we're not gonna use a lid. Some labs call for a lid, ours does not. But basically what we'll do is we'll add a chemical to the water, measure what happens to the water, and basically just do some math. The heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature by 1K or 1 degree Celsius. The molar heat of capacity, that's just the heat capacity of one mole of a substance. Specific heat is the heat capacity of one gram of any substance. And we're going to be working through these both in problems in the textbook as well as in the lab. This equation should look familiar to you. This is the specific heat equation, where Q equals CM delta T. 
Q is the heat given in joules. C is the specific heat of the metal or the water, whatever you're using. And it does have kind of a strange label, joules per gram degree Celsius. Mass is always in grams and temperature is in degree Celsius. For the record, temperature can also be in Kelvin. Now, why does specific heat have such a weird label? Well, if you look at the fact that you're multiplying it by mass and by temperature, grams and degrees Celsius will cross off, leaving you with joules. And this is why Q is given in joules. In our lab, we're going to be calculating or looking for QSOLN, that stands for solution, and QRXN, Q of the reaction. Well, what are we talking about here? Q of the solution is the heat gained or lost by the solution that is the water. Remember, we can't monitor the chemicals directly. We monitor them indirectly by looking at what happens to the water. Q of the reaction is the heat gained or lost by the reaction. Both values will be the same value, just opposite in sign. So if the water gains energy, that's because the chemicals lost energy. So you can say that Q of the solution is equal to the negative Q of the reaction. Well, how do we get Q of the solution? We're just going to do some basic math, and it's using the Q equals CMT equation. Uh, the specific heat will be for water in our lab, 4.184. The grams of solution is a little tricky. It's going to be the total mass of water plus the mass of your solid that you put in the water times the temperature change. Uh, we're always going to assume, no matter what, that even if you've put a chemical in the water, that the specific heat is going to be 4.184. We're going to use these equations in the lab. We're also going to use them in the unit. When we do the lab, though, we are going to take into account the fact that the cups, the styrofoam cups, are also absorbing heat. So it's a little bit more sophisticated than what we did in regular chemistry, but really not tough. When we get to the lab, I've designed a series of data tables for you to use that will help you keep track of all of this information and instead of doing the math one gigantic math problem, you're going to do it in pieces until in the end you calculate the molar heat of solution for each chemical reaction. Another way you can calculate delta H is with what's called Hess's law. And the basic idea here is that the delta H for the overall reaction is equal to the sum of all the individual steps in a reaction. It's very useful for calculating delta H when you can't measure it directly or you don't have the ability to measure it directly. To use Hess's law, and we'll go through an example in just a moment, you combine all the given equations to get the overall equation. This may involve flipping an equation, multiplying through, dividing by something, maybe even changing the sign in delta H. If the coefficients don't match up, again, you might need to multiply or divide, but when you do that to the coefficients in the equation, you also do that to delta H. I'll point this out in the next couple of slides as we do a problem. Let's walk through an example. We are to find delta H for the following equation. Solid carbon plus gaseous water makes gaseous carbon monoxide and gaseous hydrogen. Here are the following, following equations we are given. Basically, what those equations are, are what we call formation reactions. In other words, what's the reaction that makes up CO2? What's the reaction that makes up water? And we don't have a reaction for carbon or for hydrogen because that's just how they exist in nature. When you look at these three equations, you should notice first is everything on the correct side? Well, in the overall equation, water needs to be a reactant. When you look down below at the third equation, water is on the wrong side. The other thing you should notice is that we need, we need CO, CO, not CO2, CO as a product. But in the second equation, CO is a reactant. So here's what you need to do. You need to take that second equation and flip it. You also need to flip the last equation. This gets everything on the correct side. Now, why do I need to divide the second and the third equations by two? Well, in the overall equation, there are no coefficients. 
if you look at the second equation, there's coefficients, and we don't want that. So if we divide everything, including delta H by two, we should be able to add up those equations and get the overall equation. I'll show you how we do this on the next slide. So this is what the equations look like when you do what we talked about on the last slide. I didn't change the first equation. The second equation was flipped and divided by two. Now notice two things about delta H. I flipped it, so I changed the sign. I divided it by two as well. Same thing with the last equation. It got flipped and delta H, the sign was changed and the amount was divided by two. Notice when you add them up, some things cross off. The oxygen on the reactant side crosses off with the two half moles of oxygen on the product side, and the CO2s cross off as well. Now, if you add up the reactants and add up the products, just like you would do in an equation in algebra, you get that overall equation we wanted. As long as you get that overall equation, now you can add up those three delta H's. Pay attention to the signs. When you do this, you get a delta H value of positive 131.3 kilojoules. What does that mean? For the overall equation, the delta H is positive 131.3 kilojoules. And remember, positive means that it is endothermic. Students often get confused by the vocabulary, standard enthalpy of reaction. What is that? You're gonna notice a lot of times that delta H will have a little circle on it, and that just means it occurred at standard conditions. Delta H is given as kilojoules per mole. A lot of times we just write kilojoules, but it is actually kilojoules per mole. That is also the molar enthalpy. When you look at the appendix, that delta H value given is for one mole. That is really important because when we balance equations, sometimes we want to keep that product at one mole, which means we need to use fractions for other coefficients. And you'll see that in an example coming up. Delta H of formation for most stable elements is zero. In other words, we don't form oxygen that we breathe. It, it's just there. So the, its delta H value is zero. We don't form solid carbon. It just exists that way. So again, its delta H value is zero. So in case you're wondering why some things have values of zero, that's why. Let's take a look at how to find delta H just using math. Now I know that equation looks terribly scary, but it really isn't. The big E means sigma, and it just stands for sum of. So what you do is you find the sum of all the delta H's for the products minus the sum of all the delta H's for the reactants. You're gonna use the appendix in the back of the textbook, or there are online appendices as well, wherever you can find these values. So take a look at this equation, C6H6 liquid, plus 15 halves of oxygen gas, makes six CO2 gas and three water liquid. Pay attention to the state of matter. When you look up C6H6 in the back of the textbook, it's 49. If you look up oxygen in the back of the textbook, it's zero, which shouldn't surprise you because oxygen gas is in its natural state. CO2 gas in the back of the book is negative 393.5 and liquid water is negative 285.8. So if you look at my equation, you start with the products. Now we know that CO2 is negative 393.5. You have to multiply it by the coefficient, which is six. We know that liquid water is negative 285.8. We multiply it by three, the coefficient. Then we're gonna subtract the reactants. There's only one C6H6, so that's 49 plus essentially zero. When you do all that math, pay real careful attention to your signs, you get negative 3267 kilojoules. In other words, for this reaction, it is very exothermic at negative 3267 kilojoules.